Welcome back. We are in the middle of a 30-day happiness challenge. So you may be listening to this months later, but we are going to spend the next couple of weeks just talking about how to be happy, why it's important. And uh, today we're going to do the number one secret to happiness, according to a 75-year study from Harvard. And uh, the number one secret to happiness is actually sitting next to me. Oh, so <laughs> that's what they discover uh, to find the answers. A decade long Harvard study, decades long Harvard study has been following 700 men throughout their lifetimes. George Valiant did this study. I actually got to talk to him about it. About 60 of the original volunteers are still living. And every few years they have their blood drawn, their brain scanned. And they answer many personal questions. And the conclusions, the researchers say, all boils down to one thing. What? Married? No. What? Definitely Why? not married. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, that seems odd because you're looking at me funny. What? Luck. Ah. The clearest mm -hmm. message that we get from the 75-year study is this. Good relationships keep us happier and healthier, period. Robert Waldinger, the director of the Harvard Study of Adult Development, said in a TED Talk. And what we talk about in the happiness challenge mm -hmm. is that six. That's question number six. Am I reinforcing the behaviors I like or I dislike in others today? And it's why I collect penguins. We have a great penguin story. You all probably heard it. But um, how does that impact how you deal with Chloe and the girls? Focusing on what I like about them or what I don't like about them. Um, it, it, it makes a huge difference because um, I can easily get frustrated. I mean, I can easily get frustrated if I focus on, you know, the dishes in the sink or, you know, leaving stuff all over, you know, the house. You know, we've got kids at home doing school right now. So I think a lot of people are struggling with this. They've got their kids at home and they're frustrated by a lot of the things they normally don't have to deal with. But if I focus on, you know, the fact that like, so for me, I'll often focus on little things like, you know, I'll think about memories, like my daughter's little feet running down the hallway and I'm going to be sad when she goes away to college, but I'll focus on that memory of like those things that made me so happy or the time we spend together. Um, you know, I'll, if I focus on those things, I just, I automatically get happy, a little sad at the same time, but happy, at, you know, so that's what I really want to focus on. Um, the times we spend watching movies together at night, um, all of those things make me happy. So I don't want to focus on the things that upset me. Now we need to talk, we need to talk about it. We need to address it, but I don't need to focus on it to the point that I get frustrated. Well, within acceptable boundaries, that's right? because if you only notice what's right and you never have consequences for things that aren't right. Oh, no, we do consequences in this house. <laughs> that, that's not as effective as, as it could be. But I think the world, because of the news media, it's so focused on what's awful, right. what's terrible, so I stopped watching what's it. wrong that people's minds go to darkness. Mine will do that very quickly. I stopped watching the news for that reason. So I just, I found myself very unhappy. And when I don't watch it, I'm much happier. When I go outside and watch my hummingbirds, I'm happy. When I spend time with my family, I'm happy. Now you made a good point though. I actually think boundaries make you happier. I think when you can, in a healthy way, establish boundaries, you don't feel taken for granted. 
You don't get angry because you don't feel like people have used you or abused you. When you can, in a very healthy way, learn how to establish boundaries, you tend to be happier because you can do it in a healthy, loving way. We There's a new book out I like called Boundary Boss that I did an Instagram live um, with the author. It was so good. We should have her in the podcast. Boundary Boss, a book I highly recommend. Mm-hmm. But what I, what I want us to just focus, dig into a little bit deeper, I know, um, in fact, all of you should take the ACE test, Adverse Childhood Experiences. If you Google it, you'll be able to take 10 questions. There's an NPR site that has it. Um, in fact, James, maybe we should put the link to it. Um, if you take it, so it's on a scale of zero to 10. So 10 common, but awful experiences for children, stressful experiences for children. And if you score four or more, there are a whole bunch of bad things that happen to people from a higher risk of suicide, depression, anxiety disorders, and seven of the top 10 leading causes of death. Mm -hmm. You have a higher increase. So how your brain was shaped Mm -hmm. as a child makes a big difference. The more childhood trauma, the more you're taught to look for what's wrong rather than what's right. Wouldn't you say? And, and almost true? everyone I know, ever since I discovered this, I'm like, it's so eye opening. And all the people I know who have been through a lot of, well, like we've been talking to a lot of people we know. And the people we know, even the very well known people we know um, that have been through childhood trauma absolutely confirm this. They have more illnesses. They have more anxiety. They have more depression. They tend to notice what's wrong. Um, so, and I, and I certainly do that, but it's, it's really, really interesting knowing it though, for me has actually helped. So number one, it, I think it's funny because you'll, you'll often say, Oh, it explains everything. And it does, it sort of explains the dynamics in a relationship. But what's been really helpful is that I'll now find myself. This is why I recommend that everyone listening right now actually take the quiz. If you, if you think you've grown up with childhood trauma, because once you know, like your ACE score for me, um, and we'll talk about this in our family because my nieces have been through a lot as well. We will often talk about it. It's like, Oh, is this me reacting to now? Or is this me reacting to the past? And so I'll find myself doing that. It's like, am I, Am I really being like, am I really being upset now? Or because I mean, I just tend to notice it, like everything wrong, even when there's nothing wrong. Um, if I hear a noise, you know, in the house, I'm like up and running. And, you know, so what did you say that? Again? I tend to notice everything wrong, even when there's nothing <laughs> wrong. <laughs> so, That's so insightful. Mm-hmm. And if you know that your nervous system got programmed, for that. Oh, if I and hear noise. even your genes from past generations. And this is so just your me. grandmother growing up yeah. during the great famine, changing her genes. Mm-hmm. And she lived her whole life, In we fear. believe, with PTSD. Mm-hmm. And she lived her whole life that way, changed her genes. Your mother really struggled when she was young. Did your mother notice? what she liked about you more than what she didn't. She wasn't really home. She was always too busy and too focused on surviving. So she didn't notice. Right. I felt, I just sort of felt invisible. So she didn't notice. Um, When we come back, we're going to talk more about noticing what you like more than what you don't. I want you to make this a daily practice, which is why it's in the great seven Mm -hmm. questions to ask yourself. Um, we're going to talk more, but I really want to talk a little bit more about the ancestral dragon and, uh, the dragons that shape our current reality and how to tame them. Stay with us. You're in a war for the health of your brain. Hi, I'm Dr. Daniel Amen, founder of Amen Clinics and Amen University. My wife, Tana, and I 
created the Brain Warriors Way course. It's 26 hours of content where we walk you through how to have a better brain and a better life. If you want to survive and thrive, you have to become a brain warrior. Welcome back. We are in the middle of our happiness challenge. We're digging deeper into happiness. So um, I just find all of this so interesting. It's like all the things you can do to make yourself happier and all the things you can do to make yourself very unhappy. Well, and just going back, if you grew up with trauma, now we were talking about the ACE score, um, from zero to 10, you scored at an eight, I scored a one. <laughs> but yeah, um, in my family, people really didn't notice what they like mm. more than what they don't like. I, I remember people noticing what they didn't like mm. and how shame and guilt and ought to and must and have to um, were rampant in my house. And, and I never really learned to notice what I liked, mm -hmm. right? I, my mom was a good mom. Um, she's a really good mom. And, um, but she's just busy, right? With seven, seven kids. Children. Yeah. And siblings don't tend to notice what they like <laughs> no. because there's always competition. There's rivalry, right? Rivalry, competition. And, and so where do you learn it if it's not modeled? for you. Mm -hmm. But when your nervous system has been primed through trauma and fear, then what you're noticing is what's wrong because that was adaptive right. for you when you were young. And I've talked to a lot of people who have had this issue and, and I've heard the same thing over and over. I'm not sure that, I mean, I certainly wouldn't. And the people I've talked to, they'll say the same thing. I don't think most of us are willing to let it go, that protective reflex, that we're not willing to let go of that. But I think that a lot of us who have done a lot of work on ourselves are, like I've heard people say, even our friend last night who, you know, she's got no reason to really feel the way she feels now. But she's like, I still notice when there's a noise in the house that, you know, she has that same reaction that I have. It's like, oh, who's in my house? Um, because her childhood was crazy. But what we are willing to do, if you've done that work on yourself, if you are psychologically savvy and you've done the work, it's like, okay, I'm not willing to let the protective reflex go because you never really believe that it's every, nothing bad's going to happen, but you are willing to stop and go, okay, is this real now? Like, am I really reacting to now? Or am I, is this just an old leftover reflex that I'm reacting to everything? Right. That, that, I'm, that, I'm that scared child that needs to hide. It's really important to separate. Right, the past from the present. Right, and too often people drag their past along. And, you know, there's a new phrase that I've been saying is, well, yesterday was the last day of the past. Mm -hmm. And the more we can leave it there. But it's hard because it gets ingrained in your nervous mm -hmm. system. So like it's hard to give up brownies if you've been used to having brownies or donuts or cake or candy all the time. It, it's a daily practice. And I think you and I are actually really good about doing it with each other. Yeah. But, but again, it's, it's a practice, it's, it's a practice right. where if I really am serious about having a kind, caring, loving, supportive, passionate relationship with you, my brain will notice what I don't like. I need to train it to notice what I like. Now, there are really things that concern me or bother me that we need to talk about. Yeah. So assertiveness is important. But whenever I think about assertiveness, I'm always thinking firm. This bothers me. But doing it in a kind way. Firm and kind. Just two words you should always remember when 
you, you think about parenting or you even think in your relationships with your spouse, with your coworkers and so on. One of the reasons I think this is so important, like yesterday we spent the day together. I mean, we would schedule time to do this, to like spend time together because it's so important. If you want to be happy in your relationship, you have to schedule time together, just like you have to with your kids. Um, but we'll, we scheduled some time together and we were just being playful, but we did it consciously. And so, and I think when you, when you actually start putting this into play, what's interesting to me is that small things make you happy. You don't need bigger and bigger things. When you, when you consciously make the decision to do these things and be conscious about your happiness and focus on the things you like, you don't need bigger and bigger and more and more to be happy. So we were just playing yesterday and trying on sunglasses and laughing and I mean, silly stuff, but it, that makes you happy when you focus on it as opposed to needing to go, you know, jump out of airplanes. I'm not saying anyone who jumps out of airplanes, that's great. I love doing, you know, very intense things. I'm just saying little things will make you happy also. Well, and if you focus on, we call them micro moments of happiness, you know, what's the smallest thing. And actually the sunglass thing was hysterical. (laughs) And I sort of thought it was a big thing. Uh, It's just a huge, your sunglasses on. I look like a fly, but yeah. (laughs) A very pretty fly. (laughs) Super fly. Right. And um, so how can we make this practical? If you grew up with unhappiness, if you grew up with trauma, if you grew up with an ACE score of more than four, just know you can retrain your brain. You just have to make it conscious and, you know, continue to talk about these seven secrets and seven questions to ask yourself. But I just love um, notice what you like more than what you don't like. Um, And the question is, am I reinforcing behaviors I like today? Because just sort of left on your own, you can notice the dish is not done, notice the cabinet open or the lights on or the wrapper not thrown away or, you know, someone didn't make it all about you today. You could notice that. Or I, I just, I know how to make Tana smile. I know how to do it. And I also know how to make her yell at me. And I choose not to make her yell at me. Yeah, you're really good at choosing that. Too. Right? And so I think always being in a learning mode. I'm reading a new book called Invent and Wonder by Jeff Bezos, actually the letters of Jeff Bezos. And I was li- listening to the introduction this morning by Walter Isaacson. And he has written biographies on Leonardo da Vinci and Steve Jobs and Ben Franklin and a number of, you know, historic figures. And he said the one thing they all have in common is they're curious. Mm -hmm. And I love that word. If you can always be in a learning mode in the relationships around you and be curious about your interactions with them, be curious, not furious. It, it, it'll just pay off in the long run by better relationships. And I think it's, um, I actually would, as a practical takeaway, I strongly recommend you take the ACE quiz. We mentioned in the last one, I think we left a link. Um, but if you take that ACE quiz, I think it explains so much. Like I know when I took it, you said, oh, that explains so much about your behavior. It just explains so much about how you feel how you like, why you react to certain things the way you do. Um, it's very revealing. And I think when you understand something, it makes it easier to make changes. And there's a great and become aware. TED talk. Yeah. Awesome. Oh, so good. She's so good. What's her name? Nadine something. Harris. Yeah. Nadine Harris, Dr. Nadine Harris. It's so good. Who's now apparently the Surgeon General of California. And she is so, um, oh, I, did, I should have known that. Um, but she's so, it's just such a brilliant TED talk. And she's really brought adverse childhood experiences to the forefront of understanding why people that have had that happen 
become sick so much more often with with different um, illnesses than so normal. let's close this episode with a story mm-hmm. um day before yesterday we're out for a walk and i always love it because you know i walk three or four miles probably every day and you were able to go with me which made me happy and we found this super cute little oh, walking yeah. trail that we'd never seen before and it's sort of in our backyard what does the story make you and and as we're there this small um man um i just heard sneezed, a noise sneezed i heard a noise and she goes what did you think when you heard that noise and i went a man sneezed but i i saw him after i heard the sneeze i heard the sneeze and i looked over and i'm like oh like what what were you thinking when you heard that like i literally was ready to pick up the stick like i was like ready to fight <laughs> he's like i heard a noise i heard a sneeze what do you mean but it's classic of the way we respond to things <laughs> So back to your past, yeah, infecting the present, right? And you just want to be curious about that because over time you can dampen that reaction just by working on it, and that's where treatments like EMDR mm-hmm. or havening or brain spotting—I mean, there's a whole bunch of them popping up—that can be just so helpful for you. So stay with us. Welcome back. Um, We are in our happiness challenge and um, we're talking about secret number six, which is uh, notice what you like about others more than what you don't like within acceptable boundaries. And the question is, am I reinforcing behaviors I like or behaviors I don't like. But before we get started, I have a review I want to read. Um, This is from Gaiman Fun Penguin. Super energetic podcast and awesome info. Just found your podcast and learning from all the info you share. Love Tana's passion and thank you for sharing what you say to your daughter. Life is not fair and that is what it's what we do to be healthy. I enjoy how calm Dr. Amon is. Can you get into more parenting tips also? Looking forward to more great shows. Thank you. So it's fun. Well, there's another one I wanted to read as well. Overcoming ADD. Uh, I love Tana Amon's no-nonsense approach to nutrition. And listening to the podcast has taught me many valuable lessons to help my brain, my life, especially when it comes to dealing with my ADD. Um, we should probably spend more time talking about ADD. Mm-hmm. It's just such a common uh, issue for a lot of people who listen to the podcast. And people, so let's transition into that. People have ADD. Notice what they don't like more than what they like. And I learned about Well, and this. hold on, because we talked about ACE scores. Did you know if you have chronic childhood trauma, it affects your frontal lobes, makes them sleepier? means more likely to be diagnosed with ADD. And if you have children who have ADD, you have adult trauma. Mm -hmm. (laughs) (laughs) 
<laughs> oh, when I had Caitlin. Uh, <laughs> Caitlin's awesome. She is awesome. But as a child, hyperactive, restless, impulsive. Um, I'm like, where are you going? So I'm funny. And now she's got a couple to, kids like that. So. Always trying to get away. And you, you know, with her kids, the old one and the younger one, you got to keep your eyes on them all oh, the time. Oh, they terrify me. Terrify so me. that's what makes your limbic brain hyperactive. Mm -hmm. So when I had Caitlin and she was my third, there was never a time I could have her out just of relax. my eyesight. Yeah. I remember one day she was in the back seat. I was in the front seat. She was strapped in. And when I parked, she got out of her car seat, opened the door and ran across the parking lot. <laughs> right as I got, and I'm like, and so think about what that does to your nervous system. Yeah. If you like your child. Right. Right. And I like, <laughs> if you don't like him, it's a different story. But I liked her. And I knew I would be in deep trouble if she died. And so uh, I had so many episodes raising a hyperactive child where as an adult, my trauma brain was just on fire. Because you have to, and some of you out there who have ADD children, you know exactly what I'm talking about. <laughs> That's funny because I had the opposite experience. I, I can't relate to it at all. Mine was so overly cautious about everything, like terrified. Well, yeah. yeah, she was terrified of yeah, everything. But no, not Haven, my granddaughter. And oh, not, she's terrifying. Not Caitlin when she was young. I mean, now she's awesome and she's a good mom and all that. But um, I was chronically stressed. And I remember um, whenever I'd go to the mall, um, she'd always try to get away from me. I mean, I would hold her hand. And for those watching on video, I would hold her hand and I'd take my pinky and wrap it around her wrist <laughs> because I'm like, I need a good grip. Didn't you put her on a leash one time? No, because I wrote a column in the Daily Republic, the local newspaper oh, I see. in Fairfield. And so whenever I you went to the mall, to put her on a people recognized me. Right. And I just couldn't deal with, Dr. Amen, I love you. Why is your child on a leash? <laughs> I just, I couldn't deal with that. So what I used to do is put her in her stroller and tie her shoes <laughs> together so she couldn't get out. And she would like, look at her shoes and look at me, give me that sour oh, face. And, and I'm like, deal with it. Cause you know, I'm, I'm here to have a good time. I'm not here to chase you. It's like, where are you going? We're out being together. I remember one time we were at a picnic and I didn't have my eyes on her for like 30 seconds. And she's literally headed toward the street. Oh and I had to run at a dead sprint to get her so she wouldn't hurt herself. And Never had those issues. I had the opposite. Chloe wanted to be carried everywhere. But see how Crazy. things like this activate your nervous system. So you don't notice what you like yeah. more than what. You don't like, and it was a conscious yeah, that's like effort. a survival. You're always in survival mode. And parents who have ADD children, it reshapes. That sounds exhausting. They're right. It's totally exhausting. I mean, just when the grandkids are over, I'm exhausted. I adore them, and I'm exhausted when they leave because I'm so scared. I'm constantly terrified because they are just they have no fear. None. You have to watch all the time, which resets your nervous system. And now you begin to notice what's wrong. Yeah. Because of that. I see accidents trauma. everywhere. And also, the people with ADD, because they have sleepy frontal lobes, when you notice something you like, it's nice. Mm -hmm. And it raises oxytocin and probably a little bit of serotonin. When you notice what you hate, it raises dopamine. Mm -hmm. So it's it. So people with ADD often use so it's like negativity as a stimulant. It was very early in my career, and I was seeing Betty uh, a couple of times a week. Loved her, um, 
but she started every session with how she was going to violently, gruesomely kill herself. And I was always off balance with her because I don't want her to kill herself. (laughs) Um, I used to have the belief if somebody killed themselves, then I was a failure. And uh, I realized I can't control what other people do. I can be really helpful. Um, But, you know, as we often say, sometimes the illness wins. Anyways, with Betty, I was just always anxious until um, one day, and I'd scanned her. She had really low frontal lobe function. And she came in and she started the how I'm going to kill myself. And I don't recommend psychiatrists do this unless you (laughs) really know someone very well. And I went, okay, you need to stop that. I said, you're no more going to kill yourself than I am. You have five children. You love them. You know, if you kill yourself, you've just gifted them a 500% increased chance of killing themselves. You use that horror, those horrible thoughts. This is stimulant. You stimulating yourself with those visualizations. So interesting. And she like took a step back. She's like, she's paid me. And I'm basically telling her to stop talking about suicide. And she goes, I do that. Mm. I notice what's wrong Mm. about myself. I notice what's wrong about my kids. And I had no idea that it was because I was using it as a stimulant. Mm. And over the next year, she just got so much better. Um, We, of course, worked to balance her brain. But bad thoughts can be Mm. a bad habit. Yeah. Bad thoughts can be a bad habit. And you break bad habits by noticing them, by being curious, by seeing what triggers them, what cues them, and try to understand the reward. The reward for her was unconscious, Mm -hmm. was biochemical, if you will, and then come up with a new routine. So when I think about suicide, I really don't want to die because I'm not gifting that to my children. Um, Let me do something else. And the thing she did was notice what she liked about other people more than what she did. I think that's why I love exercise so much. And I discovered that when I was a kid because it stimulates my brain. Um, exercise has been shown when you, um, especially intense exercise for people who have sleepy brains, right. To, um, release those chemicals, to, to increase blood flow to the brain, to make you feel happier. And figuring that out for myself was one of the most important things that I've done. And I, I hear other people with ADD say the same thing. Lots of them. And it's one of the things we tell our patients is intense exercise. Short bouts of intense exercise can really help. And, you know, one, make you has, happier. one has to wonder if your, quote, ADD didn't come from the chronic stress you experienced as a child that made your sleepy, made your frontal lobes sleepier. That, you know, just as you said, people with high scores have an activated limbic brain, emotional brain, but sleepy frontal lobes. Anyways, we hope you find this helpful again your homework is you know whether you're listening to this at work or at home is the next person you come in contact with say something nice to them notice what you like more than what you don't Welcome back. We are on our happiness challenge. Um, So this is our fourth episode this week on the happiness challenge. And we've um, talked about ADD and 
all sorts of things that can interfere childhood trauma and how that interferes with your happiness. So all of these great tips on what to do to well, increase happiness. This week's really about noticing what mm-hmm. you like about other people. And those are things that can interfere with that childhood trauma. So what do you trauma. like about me? So many things. I like that you actually um, ground me. So I, because of a lot of the way that my life was, I can tend to notice what's wrong. I'm the intense one in our relationship. You are so soothing, so grounding. Um, you're the yin to my yang for sure. But when you're with me, I feel like everything's going to be okay. I just know it's going to be fine. And that makes me happy. And when we're together, I just, I feel calm. And I just, I love the time we spend together. And you notice what's good about me. And you notice what's what's right around us. I mean, I I joke that it's like you're like annoyingly Pollyanna. But <laughs> but actually, I really appreciate well, it. Someone with your brain, I would be annoyed. <laughs> right, yeah. Annoyingly Pollyanna. But no, I really so do what appreciate would it. If you were married to someone oh, God. Like you? No, I would never be married <laughs> to someone like me. No, that would be a disaster. We would probably kill each other um, because I'm very intense. I'm very aware of the things wrong around me. Um, very you know, much in survival mode. I mean, I was ready for the pandemic. I have a survival room. Um, so no, I that wouldn't work out well. No, because you're very calming. You're very balancing. So I thought you were going to say, well, I really like you make my cappuccino. And oh, no, I love all that. Shake for me That's morning. true. And you're going to make, make my hot chocolate tonight. Hot chocolate like all of that is really good, too. That's all a bonus. <laughs> no, we're, really, we're a very good fit. So what do I like about you? So many things. I love your beautiful brown eyes. Oh. I love how we always sort of connect by touch and you know even after 15 years we hold hands and we look in each other's eyes and we have a lot of tender Mm -hmm. moments and we don't attach to things that might irritate us Mm -hmm. it doesn't go over and over and over again um thank Thank yeah, you we can let things go. Java calming helps. <laughs> <out>. <laughs> or happy saffron. And during the pandemic, initially you were more freaked out than I was. But rather than argue with you about you shouldn't feel this way. Right. I went and found how to get a big you freezer. You supported me. When you bought a freezer, I just felt so like supported i was like oh wow he like he's with me in this i got this big freezer and i just suddenly felt like you understood me whether you did or not is not the point well people during the pandemic have had mismatched anxiety we've talked about that a couple of times and and there have been times in the pandemic i was more anxious than she was yeah uh, you're more anxious about the actual died. virus i wasn't as anxious about the virus and you were more anxious about you know the vaccine and things like that but i supported you through that with the, you know, even though I don't feel the same way about all of that, it's like, okay, I love you. And I'm going to support you about that because your dad died. So, and, and so if you have mismatched anxiety, if you can calm the person with high anxiety by doing the right things, mm-hmm. by doing things to soothe them, um, it, it, and just help your relationships and you can grow closer during the time of crisis The Chinese symbol for crisis is actually a combination of two symbols. It's danger and opportunity. Mm -hmm. So what is the opportunity that you found? And so many families, I think, like ours, got closer. Yeah. And one thing that I that I, especially during the pandemic, but one thing that I noticed and I and I do this, I've had to train myself to do this, and I've intentionally done this. Um sort of like we did with through the pandemic with our mismatched anxiety about different, we were anxious about different things. Um, but I do it with my daughter at different times. Um, but I do it with my daughter when I start to find myself either getting irritated or thinking that's silly or whatever it is, you know, that I don't agree with, I step back and I just say to myself, what's more important. And for us, it's like between us, it's very clear to me. There's very little in life that is more important than our relationship. So whether it is, you know, whatever it is, I don't care what it is. There's nothing politically or a vaccine or whatever that is more important to me than keeping our relationship solid and making us feel secure. 
So that's for me, that's when I know I need to drop it. It's like, this isn't worth it. Or with my daughter, she might be irritating me with something, but it's like, what's more important, the relationship or winning this, this argument or, or it, it's not worth it, the battle or the war. Yeah. And I also love that about you. Um, you don't have to be right. I mean, you'll frequently tell me when I'm, <laughs> but I told you so is one of the things I don't like that much, but um, staying with what we like. And I want you to do this exercise with someone in your life is stay away from those things you don't like, focus on what you do like, and that's, you'll get more of what you pay attention mm -hmm. to. You'll get more of what you pay attention to with your children, with your spouse, with your coworkers. If you're a boss at work with your employees, um, and I have a really good executive team at Amon Clinics and Brain MD, and they're actually really good about what they notice mm -hmm. and what they like, but can also speak the truth about things that may be problematic. Mm -hmm. and that's what we want for you. It's a big secret to happiness, which is why we spent a whole week on it. But that's your exercise. Um, write it down. Notice what you like more than what you don't like. Uh, take a picture of it. Post it on any of your social media sites, hashtag Brain Warriors Way podcast. Also, leave us a comment, question, or review. And if we read it uh, on the air, then we'll enter you into a drawing to win either one of Tana's new books, The Relentless Courage of a Scared Child, or Your Brain is Always Listening. Stay with us. If you're enjoying the Brain Warriors Way podcast, please don't forget to subscribe so you'll always know when there's a new episode. And while you're at it, feel free to give us a review or five-star rating as that helps others find the podcast. If you're interested in coming to Amon Clinics, use the code PODCAST10 to get a 10% discount on a full evaluation at amonclinics.com. For more information, give us a call at 855-978-1363.